Taking care of a hypotensive, critically ill patient is one of the biggest challenges you'll face in emergency and critical care medicine. And what it's going to require of you is a good understanding of hemodynamic principles. Now, if looking at monitors such as these and parameters such as stroke volume, cardiac index, central venous pressure, and stroke volume variance still give you headaches, then you've come to the right place. Today, we're going to be talking about shock and the hemodynamic principles behind it. So we are going to start out with very basic concepts, but we're going to ramp it up pretty quickly to the more complex stuff. Still, if you'd like to skip ahead, there'll be time indexes down in the video description to help you out. Let's take a rudimentary view of the cardiovascular system where we have a pump driving a fluid around a set of pipes. As the left ventricle contracts, it creates a, an area of high pressure in the system, and this then drives perfusion through the organs. As the blood leaves the capillary bed, it's at its lowest pressure, and upon returning to the right ventricle, then gets pumped again, but remains in low pressure as it flows through the lungs and returns to the left ventricle. Now here's a very critical concept to understand. When the left ventricle contracts, the proximal blood vessels, including the aorta, will actually expand like a balloon as they fill with blood. Then, when the left ventricle relaxes because of this mechanism, the blood pressure doesn't drop down to zero. That ballooned set of blood vessels continues to squeeze blood through the system as it returns to normal size. And by that point, the left ventricle contracts again, re-expanding the balloons. This is what creates blood pressure, this interplay between the left ventricle and the proximal blood vessels. What we're concerned with is the average pressure over time, and we call that the mean arterial pressure, because as you saw, the pressure climbs, the pressure drops, but it's the average pressure that continues to drive perfusion through the organs. Mean arterial pressure is the average pressure over time, and most of the time of this cycle is spent in diastole. So we can estimate mean arterial pressure with the following equation. We take two times the diastolic pressure, we add that to the systolic pressure, and we divide that by 3. This equation estimates mean arterial pressure under normal conditions. Now I say estimate because the true value will obviously depend on how much time the cardiovascular system is spending in diastole and in systole. But under normal heart rates, this equation is a good estimate. If you want an actual measurement, the monitors will give you the real map based on a more complex calculation. So now let's take a closer look at the two components that make up mean arterial pressure. And we've already discussed these. First, there's going to be the amount of blood that comes out of the left ventricle, and that's known as a cardiac output. Cardiac output always refers to the left ventricle only, not the right. And that's because the left ventricle is the one pumping blood to the periphery. The second component of MAP has to do with the blood vessels. Remember that the blood vessels have to squeeze down in order to keep blood flowing through the system, even when the heart is at rest. And that squeezing, that tension, produces a resistance that's called systemic vascular resistance, or SVR. This is sometimes also referred to as total peripheral resistance, but the terms are interchangeable. SVR is going to be one of those parameters that you can monitor with a hemodynamic monitor in the ICU. The normal range runs about 800 to 1200, but don't memorize this. Just be aware of the concept. Now when SVR fails, that is to say when there's a massive vasodilation, the blood pressure will drop and a shock state will result. And we call this distributive shock. And that's because the blood is pooling in places instead of moving like it should. So it's a problem with distribution rather than volume. Now distributive shocks are sometimes described as warm shocks. And here's why. Typically in a shock state, adrenaline release causes vasoconstriction at the periphery. And that vasoconstriction results in cold, clammy, pale skin. In this case, the opposite is happening. Everything is vasodilating, including the skin. And that's going to keep the skin normal color and warm. And that's why these shocks are different. Now, there's a few different causes of this. One can be an injury to the spinal cord, which interrupts the nerve signaling to the blood vessels. And without that nerve signaling, the blood the blood vessels will all dilate out. And this is what's known as neurogenic shock, and it's often the result of a spinal cord injury. 
More common is an infectious cause. So septic shock is when an overwhelming infection causes the release of all these inflammatory mediators into the bloodstream. And those inflammatory mediators, like cytokines, are going to vasodilate everything. Similar to this is anaphylactic shock. In this case, it's an allergic reaction causing a histamine release. So it's histamine that's driving the vasodilation in this state. And now there are some metabolic states that can cause this as well. One of them is adrenal crisis, and that's when a lack of corticosteroids is going to result in kind of the same effect of a massive vasodilation. And this is treated with steroids, obviously. Now let's jump back to cardiac output and look at its components. So first, there's stroke volume. Now what this is, it's a volume. It's the amount of blood coming out of the left ventricle per stroke or per beat. That's going to be measured in milliliters per beat, and it's another parameter that you can monitor. The heart is beating a certain amount of times per minute, and so if we take these and multiply them together, it gives us a volume in milliliters per minute, and we've canceled out the beats unit here. Now, when we're talking about volumes over one minute, they're going to be large volumes, and so we convert milliliters to liters per minute. And so now we have cardiac output, which is usually about 4 to 8 liters per minute. That's the normal range. This is another parameter that you can monitor on the hemodynamic monitor. Something to keep in mind is that people come in all sorts of shapes and sizes. And so if we want to get a, a more accurate evaluation of cardiac output, we can divide this by the person's body surface area. And that way we take size into consideration. And this results in a parameter called cardiac index. Cardiac index normally runs about 2.5 to 4. And the way I remember this is just start at 2 and keep doubling. So 2 to 4 is cardiac index, and then 4, double that to 8, and that gives you your cardiac output. Cardiac index is measured in liters per minute per meter squared because it's divided by body surface area. And that's going to be another parameter that you can monitor on the hemodynamic monitor. Thanks for watching part one of this new series. Next episode, we'll dive deeper into the components of stroke volume and how dysfunctions here result in various other forms of shock. If you like the content, don't forget to subscribe. And remember, don't aim to memorize. Aim to understand so that you can then apply what you've learned. Until next time.